everybody, welcome to the IAIB Spotlight. This is the show where we talk about internet broadcasting, podcasting, new media, and we interview people uh, that I, I find really interesting. We've had a, a great guest list so far, and uh, I'm having the same people on because I like to talk about certain things, and it's very difficult to talk about it within an hour, especially when you have the guests that I have on today. Uh, Rob Greenlee's joining me. Uh, hey, Rob, how you doing? Doing fantastic, Andrew. It's great to be back on the show again and kind of catching up. And, and you know, I think the, the last time we talked, I was working at Microsoft, and, and so now I'm not. So I think that the topics can shift a little bit and maybe expand. Absolutely. So you know, yeah. the last time when you were on, uh, and this is the problem, and, and I try to explain this to the viewers, um, I, this season of the show, because I've broken this show up into seasons. I do 12 mm -hmm. of them, I take a couple months off, and then come back to it. This season, I'm going to have a lot of returning guests on. And the reason for that is I get constantly I get emails saying, like, how come you didn't ask Rob this? Or how come you didn't ask Mike Phillips this question? Uh, and, like, this goes on for months. And I started <laughs> jotting down all the questions. And I've decided that I'm going to ask, you know, the guests this season all the questions that the viewers have sent me over the last two years that I've been doing this. Uh, and But you are a guy that is new media. You are a guy that has been involved in podcasting for many, many years. Uh, now you're the CTO of Podcast One, uh, a, a name that anybody involved in podcasting knows at this point, uh, and I have a ton of questions about them. But how has the transition been for you? Because you were on tr uh, terrestrial radio, you had a, mm -hmm. a radio show, you mm -hmm. did a podcast many, many years ago. I think you told me like in the late '90s you started one, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, actually, it wasn't a podcast at that point, but yeah, yeah, it was a broadcast uh, show. It was but you were you were distributing show. it online. Which mm -hmm. it's yep. not something that was common at that point, and now no, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, it was mainly streaming back then too. Yeah, streaming barely, right? Barely yep. streaming. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a big fan of Iata, and Iata yeah. was one of the first to really, you know, push it. But unfortunately, bad timing. A lot of money was wasted, and they kind of, you know, they they kind of went went under after that. But how have you? How has the transition been for you? Because you're a tech guy, and so yeah. you're involved. But it still, it still has to be interesting for you to see the shift happen from terrestrial broadcasting, traditional means of broadcasting, to what we now refer to as new media. Yeah, it has been. I mean, and, and that's that's one of the reasons where why I'm I'm working at Podcast One is because of that experience. And what the opportunity is, I think, looking forward is that convergence between broadcast radio and on-demand radio or podcasting. There's a lot of um, synergies there and there's a lot of uh, conflicts there. So it's, it's an interesting kind of um, uh, opportunity to, to converge those two mediums. And I do think of them as very different mediums. Podcasting and broadcast radio is, is a little... Um, at opposite ends of the spectrum in some ways, but in a lot of ways, there's a lot of common ground. And I think the challenge is, and has been, is, um, you know, as podcasting has evolved, it's kind of taken on its own kind of way of doing things. And broadcast radio has always had their 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 way of doing things. And those don't always match up. And, so so and tell me about this. Yeah. You, you, because you pose a very interesting question. What are the differences? I mean, we could tell, we could obviously see the similarities between the two, but what are the what are the major differences that people have an issue? You know, if they're transitioning from broadcasting to podcasting, or even now, a lot of podcasters are transitioning into, you know, traditional broadcasting, which is yeah. unbelievable. So, what are those differences that that could be an issue? Well, I think that the fundamental ones are, um, you know, ad densities. Um, you know, how many spots run in in programs is probably the biggest difference. I think that the the other part of it is uh, duration of programming, and um, what type of show can be long, um, and then also the the local versus national aspects of 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 content. And what what's been really interesting about working at Podcast One is that the, the founder, uh, Norm Pettits, who uh, started Westwood One, which was a huge uh, nationally syndicated, uh, national syndicator of uh, broadcast radio shows back, started back in the 70s, um, he was thinking of radio as a national medium, 
where a lot of a lot of the industry today thinks of themselves as a local medium. Uh, and I think that that's if you cut through all of the kind of um, hype about the podcasting space and broadcast radio and cut right to the chase, that is the difference is is uh, those key things. And and also it gets back very quickly back to talent. It gets back to uh, whether or not a talent has the ability to 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 do a national show or just a local show. And I I believe that podcasting is still not yet a a local medium yeah it's so funny you bring that up because i was having a discussion with somebody and you know we we were the guy is a podcaster and uh we were we were at a bar we were drinking he goes what do you think is wrong with podcasting and and, you know in in a a drunken stupor i go you know what the problem is we don't do any local shows everything is targeting national our ads are targeting national ads they're you know the podcasting Mm -hmm. ads are, are broad obviously because people are listening from everywhere and I was saying it may be the thing that really monetizes a podcast is if you kind of focus in on the local aspect of it. When mm-hmm. I started doing my network, I named it the guys from Queens Network, and it helped us out tremendously getting local ads, local businesses, sure. a local uh, following. And we've kind of transitioned into more of you know the GFQ network, and we're more broad mm-hmm. now. But I kind of did it backwards, and people thought I was crazy that I was using the Queens name, but it kind of helped in the beginning. Uh, I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but I do feel that local is definitely missing. How do we concentrate on local advertising and and local style content, much like radio? How do we do that when, you know, a guy from England is listening to a guy from Queens? Yeah, I don't know that there's an easy answer, but I know if you look at kind of the the macro view of the web and the internet and what's happened with, with content and this this convergence of um, real world and virtual world, right, uh, is that there's been a steady progression, right, over the last decade or more of the the web and the internet um, and apps now getting more granular to the real world and local local aspects. So I think if it's not just a a, a macro trend around podcasting that I'm talking about here, I think it's just a general kind of content and um, trans. I guess of things that we have um, done in local areas, right, and transfers them over to more of a, you know more and more digital, right? Sure. I, and I think if you look at you know like companies like Uber and you look at uh, the Airbnb, those are all similar kind of trend lines around how the internet and technology are starting to transform what we do in a local aspect. Absolutely. And I think. And I think podcasting is kind of riding along that trend line. And until we get a big enough audience for podcasting, which will take you know additional years uh, in each market, right? Um, you know that that local aspect will not be fully um, fully built out. It's just going to take time. Sure, I, I had a conversation with Noah from Stitcher a while ago. Um, mm-hmm. I, it was probably at Blog World, and you know he, he was we were just talking, and he goes, "What would you what would you like to see in the app?" And if you like tune in and Stitcher, all these applications have a local following. If you've noticed, yep. you could you could you could sort out based on location, but that doesn't exist for podcasts. It only exists for radio mm-hmm. stations. And I go, why can't you do that for podcasts? Why can't I yep. say, um, you know, I want to find every podcast in Seattle, or I want to find every podcast based in New York, and it'll based on where you are, it'll tell you you're five miles away from this podcast. I think that's a great. Uh, a great tool for people because that's the thing that sells radio. Local radio yeah. still makes a killing. National shows are having a difficult time, but if you're yep. you know, if you're a small market, a, a lot of them do well because mm-hmm. it's your target audience. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a struggle that that exists for very fundamental reasons, and I think that the the biggest reasons are is that the the content that you're referring to that are local in those apps are are focused on local. You know, most podcasts are not focused on local. I know that there's been a few podcasts that I followed that that have tried to do that model um, that were like former um, morning talk jocks in a given market would launch a show and they would only talk about what's happening in that that local market. It just happened yeah. to be that they just weren't on a broadcast signal at that time. They were doing it as a podcast. But I think that those shows kind of kind of struggle and then they, they they invariably wind up thinking more about national topics and national issues to build their audience. And that takes them right back into the, the whole national realm because there's not enough people in any given city that are 
listening to, to on-demand radio and podcasting yet to justify that focus. You so, know, I was a big fan yeah. of Howard uh, when he was on the radio here. And, you know, he's a New York yep. guy, but he was nationally syndicated in 100 markets, whatever it was. And, mm -hmm. yes, he was a national show. But every now and then he would talk about the Long Island Expressway. You know, yeah. and, and he would do, he would talk about Long Island. He would talk about the town that he was from. And I think something like that for someone from the area, like, oh, wow, you know, he's talking about my area. He's talking about the streets that I know. Uh, that's kind of adding a, a local feel to a national show. But you're absolutely right. It, it's, you're trying to, you're trying to appeal to as many people as possible. And it's kind of difficult when you're talking about, you know, something that only a few people are going to kind of get. Yeah. I, I even see it in the big national media too. Um, you know, like, the evening news that's on the East Coast, and and there's there tends to be a little bit of it feels like anyway, and I think it has a lot to do with convenience, but uh, more coverage of East Coast issues, right? Um, so I think it's uh, versus West Coast, you know, stuff because it's more difficult to get that news. Yeah. So I think um, there is an aspect of of convenience here too of access that will contribute to I think long term. I I think more and more. Um, online radio will become local. I just think it's just going to take time and more people, you know, adopting and listening. And it, it's this trend line that has to ride between. Well, the content has to be there before the the listeners will be there, right? Um, so it's it, it's the chicken and the egg thing. What what's going to drive it forward? And I think it's just going to be an evolution that happens very slowly. So that that was kind of my next question. Uh, I think podcasting is constantly growing. Uh, you see articles from people say is podcasting dead. I, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. When yeah. everything, everything is transitioning online, so how could you say podcasting is going away? What I do mm -hmm. kind of see possibly happening is the little guys are. It's going to be harder for them to get the attention that they once got, but that's the evolution of the product, and more big players are coming into it, and you're seeing more brands kind of push. Uh, you, you know, the Adam Carollas and the Joe Rogans. I mean, these are names in podcasting now. And mm -hmm. Joe Schmo that's starting a podcast is going to have a harder time establishing his audience because, you know, it's not it's not yeah. what it was 10 years ago, obviously, when you yeah. know, podcasting was just starting. Yeah. What do you see the evolution for this way of consuming content over the next 10 years? What's going to be the thing that kind of makes it, okay, uh, the average Joe is now listening to a podcast. Uh, the soccer moms listen to a podcast. What's going to transition that? Because that's when you become mainstream. Yeah. Well, I think we are mainstream right now. It's just not to the same um, level of scale that we have with radio even today. But, but I think what's going to happen and what's going to um, push this forward is ease of access. I think it's, it's progressively getting easier and easier to get access to the content. Um, and I think that's going to keep progressing. And I think as our, our, our mobile phones get smarter and smarter about wh how they can analyze our, our lives and, and give us the, the information that, that we want when we need it, all that kind of stuff, they become a lot more intelligent about what's going on in our lives. That These things can be more easily scheduled in and we get r reminders of when new episodes are coming out. So I think there's a little bit of a technology and usability um, aspect of this. But I still think the content is king, and I think content is what's going to drive this 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 overall adoption curve. I mean, what type of shows are people um, people just don't adopt technology just for technology's sake? They they adopt it because they're either trying to share information or they're trying to get access to something that they have an interest in. And I think you know fundamentally that's that's what I'm that's why I made the shift in my career that I made going from you know uh, running an aggregator to a content play is because I believe content is is the phase that we're in right now and I think content is going to drive that growth in audience that podcasting needs um, and there's genres of content out there that are untapped currently right, right now that are not being being exploited I mean we we at Podcast One launched a bunch of uh, shows around, pro, you know, with pro wrestlers. Which and it's was doing a phenomenal. I mean, it's area doing great. that uh, that 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 wasn't tapped before, and I think that that reaches into another segment of of potential audience that helps grow podcasting. And there's other areas that we can pull into this space that will capture kind of kind of unique um, kind of kind of groups of of you know affinity following that will uh, will help propel forward that uh 
that that change towards you know getting getting the kind of content that we want when we want it, and that's you know we've talked about that many times. Sure, Let, let's talk about podcast yeah. one a little bit because uh, I know the name. Uh, obviously, you know the name. You're the CTO of the company, but uh, <laughs> g- give me describe podcast one for someone that doesn't really know what it is and and how it works and who's on there. Just give us you know the the, the spiel a little bit of what they're doing. Yeah, it's a really kind of complicated story because the company is trying to do an awful lot. It's it's trying to be a a podcast platform, um, not unlike a like a Lipson or or um, you know where we have our whole back end system that publishes podcasts and and we work with a variety of, of 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 external content providers as well as we produce a, a whole slate of of uh, shows ourselves in our own studios. Um, so we'll work with, uh, you know, folks like, uh, uh, the Nerdist. We'll work with folks like, uh, the Adam Carolla show or Carolla digital. We actually, um, you know, exclusively handle their, their podcast and their network. Um, I'm talking about the Carolla digital folks. And so, you know, my job is to basically manage their technology back end for, for, for that whole network. And so it's, those are those are the type of relationships that are are, are mainly what we focus on, and we all, uh, we do all the ad sales wow. and ad ad repping for all those shows to New York and L A and Chicago and and all all the key markets, trying to drive um, you know sponsorship into programs uh, from major advertisers, to big big brands, uh, and that's that that's that's the really the, at the core of what the company is. It's an ad sales company. And a content provider. It's a content producer and, and content partner. And my my job is to help uh, you know a couple hundred shows be successful. And that's a big job. I mean, that's a try, tremendous job. Trying to to manage that that many shows at, at a very deep level, where where we actually have our own producers that are that are um, formatting the shows, working with the hosts. All that stuff to make their shows successful. So, and, so not only yeah. are you are you handling the ads, not only are you handling the back end, you're also handling the success of the show. Yeah, which which the, is rare, which you don't see a lot of other people yeah. doing. Yeah, the the marketing and the social media, uh, and then um, working with those shows to 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 refine them and make them better, and and that's the. That's that's the real value prop, and then you know our CEO is is uh, always bringing in new talent. I mean, it's a parade of celebrities coming into you know his office to talk about doing shows and things like that. So we're we're trying to pull in new talent um, that that may or may not be successful as podcasters, but but we're pushing the envelope trying to find those kind of kind of unique um, you know. You know opportunities, but yet at the same time, Podcast One is very much involved in broadcast radio. They own the Love Line radio show, and so we we also manage the the online side of the the Love Line show as well. Um, so it's it's really a, being there is really a a really fascinating place to be because it it is kind of at the the point of convergence of radio and podcasting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm I'm looking down the yeah. website. You got Dan Patrick's on there. You got Adam Carolla. Yep. I, I mean, you you have those are big radio names. How if if I'm you know Joe Schmo and I'm doing a podcast, can I be on Podcast One? How does that work? How do you discover new content? What are you looking for when you're bringing people on? Well, most of what we currently work with right, right now are really really big shows, um, and that's that. That's our focus: um, is trying to provide premium service and support to really, really large shows. And and the big reason that we have taken that model is because um, to get big brand advertisers involved in sponsoring a show, they're looking for scale. And so most of the shows that you see there are typically shows that are doing tremendous downloads. Like we just launched the Snooky podcast. Um, which has done phenomenally well, um, and you know, the scale of these things are are, are key for us currently. Um, that, that's not to say that we'll always be focused on just just the big shows, but it just makes it easier for us to to, to sell advertising and kind of bundle big shows together, so the big brand brand folks can come in and say, "Yeah, I want to buy into this and this," and there's this many you know downloads and 
And, you know, we feel really comfortable with that. And, and, you know, we know we're going to make an impact on that. And then we, we can also do geo targeting sure. of, uh, spots as well. It can be host red or it can be pre pre-produced spots, but we, we can do very, very precise geo targeting into geo markets, you know, cities and things like that. So if a, a chain of stores or what, what whatever is, you know, is heavily concentrated in a, in a, like a region of the country, then we can target that that region specifically with their ad, and then then you know if they have another brand that's in a you know but it's part of the same company that's in another market, then then we can target target an ad just to that market. Now, and we're so. not we're not just talking about celebrity. I mean, the celebrity aspect is obviously a major part of what you guys do because they bring in the eyeballs, they bring in the listeners. Uh, yep. But you don't have to be a celebrity to be on podcast one. I mean, I, I don't. I don't feel like that's the main focus of no, what you guys no, are doing. It, no, it's not. I mean, I think you know. I think really, it gets back to talent and your ability to build an audience and build a a, a fan base, uh, and be able to communicate and be able to be engaging. And I mean, a lot of that part of it is very much uh, rooted in radio. Um, you know, those talents that made a a talk radio host successful uh, in multi markets um, can can very much translate into building an audience in podcasting. So that's part of where those those two things converge on on each other and are very similar. Um, but there is a different kind of cadence to podcasting that that I believe that you have to have that radio has kind of not entirely been down, and that's the the very personal aspect and the the more raw aspects. Uh, it's not as polished, not as, you know, um, fewer commercials. It just, it's much more kind of, um, organic feeling is, is what works in podcasting. And there's a little bit of a tension there between radio and podcasting in that way, because there is a tendency on the radio side to be a, probably a little over, overproduced. Sure. Um, so I think that's that's where part of the the whole format shift has to happen, and I think there's a little bit of tension. And I've been really kind of looking into this too, is duration, because I mean a lot of big radio talkers uh, will do three hours a day, right? And and in traditional thinking on in podcasting is that that probably wouldn't work in podcasting, right? It's too much content. But what I'm finding is is that it gets back to engaged audiences. It gets back to how how passionate your your audience is towards the content that you're producing because um the dan patrick show puts out three hours a day five days a week and they have huge numbers in podcasting but i think that he's probably a little bit of a unique case i'm not sure that every podcaster can put out that much content and, and um, get it all listened to <laughs> so, yeah i mean the the timing thing is 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 kind of tough i i've always felt that two hours kind of becomes the max Depending on what on type a of daily show you're basis, doing. No, on on a, on a week, yeah. I, I mean, on a daily basis, yeah. it depends on the show. I I, I still feel yeah. that it gets overwhelming for a podcaster, and th- I don't think this is true for every show. But radio, you're telling the story, and you have three four hours to tell that story. Yeah, you, you, it's a slow burn. With podcasting, I think the listener's attention span is a little less than what you're getting in the car. You know, you kind of have yeah. to listen if you're in the car. But if you're doing I mean, I'm cleaning the house. I'm I'm walking the dog. I come back, so I'm in and out. And yeah. you got to kind of keep it going to keep the attention going for uh, for the listener. Yeah. Is there the question of numbers? Now, I'm not going to ask you any specific numbers for any show, but for someone that is, you know, working in the back end, and and you kind of see numbers, and and you've been involved in podcasting, I get asked this all the time. Uh, I don't think there is a there's a real answer for this, but what do you consider a good number for a show? What what are decent numbers for a podcast? Well, I think it gets back to what you're trying to accomplish and what your goals are. Because um, I mean, if you're trying to monetize a podcast um, with sponsorship and advertising, I think you you generally need to have a big big audience. And and when I say big audience, it's like you know, more than ten thousand downloads per episode. Um, Per yeah. per episode, um, but I think it, a a person can have a successful podcast at a much lower level, and I think there are many examples of that. I think it depends on how you how focused your show is and how how effective you are at at reaching a very passionate um, smaller audience, and are you bringing value t- to them 
in a way that benefits you. And th- there's a bunch of different ways that a podcast can benefit someone. It can build their their reputation as an expert in something that they can, you know, parlay into a career or into some other um, service that they can offer so on a smaller scale. And, and there may be um, genres of podcasts, and I've I, I've heard many examples of this that were focused on a particular area. That there there are um, companies out there that want to reach that particular target audience, yeah, and are willing to pay a flat rate to you know it, it may be a really high CPM to be able to reach that two or three thousand people. Um, but it's working for know, them. That's the but thing. It, yeah. But it but it creates results, and and especially if the 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 product or whatever that's being promoted is a is a little bit of a higher end um, price ticket. Uh, I think it can it, it can work well, and it doesn't have to be a traditional advertising relationship. It can just be like you know like a you know a a passionate read on the part of the the, the host. But that's one end of the spectrum, and then I think that the other end of the spectrum is the area where Podcast One is focused on, and that's big shows, more of a nationally syndicated radio model. Um, but in, in the the on demand kind of digital side, um, so it's you know I think that the spectrum is open there for success at all levels. I I just think that you as a podcaster you need to think about what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish, and then try and fashion what you're doing with your show um, to to do two things: make sure that it's your passion and that you can bring passion to it when you talk about it. Uh, it to to build passion in other people. And then they'll they'll connect with you, and and you got to be genuine, transparent, and you got to um, care about your your listener and speak to them as people and individuals, not as a group. I think that that that's a key thing too. Um, but but I think anybody can have success in podcasting. It just you just have to have some very specialized skills and learn about a lot. I've been wor- working with a you know a few podcasters down in L.A. that have reached out to me that you know are looking for advice and things like that and. And I tell them the same thing. I just tell them, you know, you got to be passionate about it. You got to do these basic things. And, and uh, you know, it's up to you at that point. With, um, with advertisers, uh, yeah. I know at Podcast One you guys have some unique ads. Uh, I listen to the Steve Austin show all the time. By the way, I just want to tell you, uh, there's nobody that does a better live read than him. Yeah. His live yeah. reads are just, uh, they're, they're out of control. But... You know what? I listen Carolas to Corolla's really good too. Corolla's uh, are great Carolas too. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for a guy yeah. that has no radio experience, uh, yep. no broadcasting experience, yeah, he was he was he's a major celebrity. He was on TV, he's a pro wrestler, he would do promos and he knows how to talk, but this guy could sell anything. I mean, it's it's actually unbelievable his, how capable yep. he is of being a radio host. And if it wasn't for podcasting, he wouldn't be on the radio. No. He wouldn't be doing this. I, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> but how do you see where do you see the ads headed? Because if you listen to a podcast, and, and this is this is the problem with the ads in podcasting, there's a lot of the same ad happening on every show. Yeah. Um, yeah. How well, do you break out beyond that? How do you break out beyond, you know, the three top advertisers, uh, you know, an Audible, uh, you know, all, all the ones that are doing all the buy-ins for the podcast? What, how do you go beyond that and then you start bringing in different ads? Well, and that's exactly what Podcast One is is actually doing. Is we're working with big brand brand advertisers um, that are looking to do that. But th- those folks have very unique needs uh, and what they, they they expect. And most of them have been buying into radio, so they they tend to think like that. So you have to kind of um, you have to look at on demand radio is just a um, is very similar to broadcast radio and how you present it to them because that's what that's what they understand. That's that's the models that they're they're buying after or buying around is um, more broadcast side. So you have to, and this is what Podcast One is trying to do is trying to take the digital side right and translate it into something that they understand um, more from the analog world. And and I think that's what we're trying to accomplish. The 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 issue gets back into is how are the the spots produced and what what the spots are right? right are they host reds or are they pre-produced spots produced more traditionally like you know you know like an ad agency or something like that and so we're always trying to work with those folks to try and make those those agency spots um, sound a little bit more organic and and more like a traditional podcast spot. But but the whole metric side is also a big factor here too. Of trying uh, in the podcast one is trying to do this model of 
of um, taking you know research data and 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 digital download data and combining them together um, to to have numbers that the the brand advertisers are comfortable with um, you know more around ad impressions and using the uh, the the language that those folks understand to be able to tap into broadcast radio budgets, which are currently in the billions of dollars. Sure. Uh, the digital side is in the the single digit millions of dollars right now in podcasting. So, and that's where you traditionally see you know the the direct response advertisers, what you were talking about before. Um, so we are very focused on trying to go after those big brand advertisers, but we have to translate it into a to a way of presenting to them that that conforms to how they are currently buying. How do you what are the, what are the issues that uh, currently not necessarily specific advertisers, but you guys have letting people know how it works for a podcast compared to a traditional broadcast on the radio? Uh, is that part of the difficulty that they learn the culture of how digital works compared to you know analog? Is is that the issue, or is it just? The numbers are just, they're looking at numbers and the numbers are really just not there when you go to these advertisers. No, I think that it's, um, they're looking for scale, you know, and that's part of the reason why the company has the focus that it has is they're, those buyers um, like the fact that there's a network, right? And that we have a variety of shows in, a, in genres that they're interested in participating in. But, you know, most of the big brand buyers are very conservative too and, and, what types of shows that they want to invest their their money and their brand to be associated with, you know, uh, so so they're very careful about um, being being a part of certain programs uh, based on their their brand. So you have to have programming that is um, safe for them or is is kind of fits with the the image of the brand that they have, right? And and also has an audience that would be likely to to purchase whatever that that brand is offering uh, or to to get involved in that brand in some way. And so that's 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 the challenge. It, it, it seems like we are at a crossroads right now with the transition of, you know, terrestrial broadcasters realizing, mm -hmm. oh, wow, you know, I don't have to deal with 90 percent of the stuff that I was dealing with if I come over to the Internet. And there is a there is a success rate. You look at an at a Tom Likas, for example, that is now on uh, yep. terrestrial, uh, now on internet broadcasting, yeah, and Adam Carolla, and and they're doing well. I mean, they're they're they they are showing that there is life after traditional radio. Yep. Do you see a trend happening where podcasters do the reverse, where they go <sighs> into terrestrial radio or satellite radio, even because you don't see a lot of that? I know it's been attempted a couple times. And yeah. I'm surprised that they are not using podcasting as almost like a, like a farm system to grab people and say, okay, you know what? You're doing really great. We want to put you on the radio. I think you could do great in this market or whatever it is. Yeah, I think we we kind of haven't reached that point yet. I think that's still a couple of years off. But where I have seen that, that happen here recently is some of the big radio networks have been um, tapping into YouTube talent lately, So, um, which I thought, was an interesting trend that they didn't pull it from podcasting, um, <laughs> but Which is, it, the, isn't that bizarre? Isn't yeah, that weird? Yeah. yeah. And, and but look, I don't want to. I don't want to burn any bridges here. But you know what? That's like that's like a guy yeah. sitting at a desk is like, you know what we need to do? That YouTube is is happening. You know, yeah. my my son told me about that YouTube. Let's grab a couple people from the YouTube and put them on. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> you know, like <laughs> it's not the same. It's not. No. Well, I mean, if you think about it, some of the the YouTube stars out, out there, and they're they're usually younger, popular, you know, like a Tyler Oakley type, or there's a there's a bunch of um, you know ones out there that kind of do daily talk shows, right? Um, that they just talk to their fans and they they engage at a very deep level. I've met a few of them, and and what they tell me is is. And really, it's not a whole lot different than what they're doing in podcasting today. It's just it's a different medium, right? Yeah. It's video, right? So the the translation that's happening here is the these personalities are connecting with an audience, right? It gets back to what I was saying earlier. They're able to build fan bases, and they're they're funny and and their lives are entertaining, and um, other other people will connect with that, right? 
And so the thinking is, is that that's translatable to, to radio. And, you know, they'll be up on Sirius or XM or something like that. And they may connect. Uh, my thought is they probably won't because most young people don't listen to XM and Sirius. Um, they, you know, but, but they feel like they need to try, you yeah. know, to try and pull people over that, over to XM and Sirius that are younger. Um, but I don't believe it's going to be successful. I think younger people will more likely connect with uh, podcasting than they will with satellite radio. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I have two younger yep. brothers. Um, you know, I'm 30. My, my brother is 19 now. He's going to be 20. Yep. And now he is getting into podcasting. Now at 19, 20. And mm -hmm. he listens, yeah, actually, he's a big fan of Podcast One. He listens to Podcast One all the time. Uh, so he's at that age now where he's becoming an adult and he's getting into it. But I don't think a 15 year old has, for me, it was different. I grew up on radio. I listened to radio since I was, you know, 12 years old. I was listening to Howard, you know, sneaking in headphones and listening to the show. Mm -hmm. For me, I was brought up with it. So this long form of content works for me. I actually enjoy the long form content. I think there is a major disconnect between my generation and the generation after me where now three to five minutes, that's what they're getting. That, that's how they get their information. I, I, yeah. I'm, I, that's the crossroad I think we're at with, you know, new media, especially because I don't think a 15 year old is going to listen to me because they're going to get bored. <laughs> because they're going to be presented with so many other opportunities to, to get the same exact information. To, well, that or, 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 or to connect with more people in that period of time or to, to put out, you know, to post on Twitter or Facebook or something like that. There, there's just more stimulation. You yeah. know, it takes concentration to listen to a long podcast. And, and I'm not sure that, you know, there's a certain segment of the population out there that's just bouncing from one thing to the next, right? They're not able to stay focused on something for very long. Do you think that helps podcasters in the sense that it's an older demo? Uh, when you look at, when I look at my demo, uh, it, it's an older demo. Yeah. And the older demo obviously has more money than a 15-year-old. So is that yeah. the thing that's kind of going to help us, you know, with, with the advertisers to say, like, look, you know, yeah, I'm doing a comedy show. Uh, it's a young, yeah. You know, there's a young feel to it, but look at my demo. Look, look at who's listening to the show. And you know what? This yeah. is exactly your market and they got money. Well, it, well, Andrew, let me put it to you this way. Um, one, one good thing about young people is they get older. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm getting a couple grays yeah. and I'm not, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's not good for me. <laughs> and I, and, and I think that the big question is whether or not they're going to, as they get older, are they going to start to appreciate um, what podcasting presents for them in their, their, their lives. And I think that's, in some ways, th that's an unknown um, question or unknown answer at this point, uh, whether or not younger people that are connected to, you know, the short form content, you know, if you look at Stitcher, you look at a lot of the more modern podcast apps, they've been really focused on short form clip content. And, and I'm just not sure, you know, I know we're, we're of the mind that, that I think in the bigger picture, people like to, to connect with personalities and, and, um, stories. Uh, and I think, um, that is not necessarily, those two don't jive with each other. You may, I mean, you can't listen to a really a two minute clip or something like that and be able to really connect with anything. Um, and, and to, to feel passion. I mean, you know, like a show like Radio Lab or This American Life or any of those kind of things, those are not two-minute shows. And they, yeah. they have huge audiences and, and followings because people people like to listen to stories. And I I, I just don't know if uh, if younger people are going to transition into that as they get older. I, I think that they, they will because, you know, back when I was young, I didn't listen to long-form stuff either. Um, but as I got older, I, I started to appreciate that stuff more. Um, so I think that there's hope. <laughs> I, I hope so. You know, and, and seeing my brother now uh, listening to all these podcasts, he's, he's listening to the Steve Austin show and he listens to Adam Carolla. Um, yep. it, it actually, it gives me hope that, you know what? Everybody says, oh, yeah, the, the kids aren't listening. Yeah, at, at some point they're not listening, but eventually you're right. They get older and they're listening to this, but this is how he's consuming his content. Yeah, he still goes to YouTube. He doesn't have a cable TV. Uh, he yep. has a Roku so that he has a Netflix account, he has Hulu. So that's how he's consuming this data. And you know what? It's all new media. It's a new way yeah. of consuming the data. And, yeah. and regardless if you're watching a film on Netflix or you listen to a podcast, it's still not the traditional way you do it. 
Yep. Um, so we got we have like 15 minutes. I want to talk to you about discoverability. Uh, yeah. You deal with a lot of podcasts. Uh, you're part of that whole entire thing where you you have to manage all these podcasts. You have to get them discovered. You have to present them. And, uh, you know, the social media helps, obviously. But what are some tips that you could give somebody? I'm not saying an up and coming person with the simple stuff, but, uh, you know, someone that is kind of established and they just want to take it to the next level. What are some things that they could do? Is it really that the market hasn't matured so discoverability is going to be still be difficult or are there things that we could do on our own uh, to, to kind of put ourselves out there? Well, I think that discoverability really gets back to the the content and the presentation of the content. And, and I don't think that it's hard to be found these days, um, but but it's hard to find a a show that that is really compelling and and is really uh, presented in a professional way in a in a compelling way and i think that's that's the key i think to discovery and um i mean every podcast i mean i see it every day i th- one of the the bigger challenges though is that there's just so much content out there and that's only going to get more and more. And I think that here over the last six months, there's just been an explosion of podcast content. I mean, it's just been phenomenal. I mean, I've been working in this space for, well, since it started. And th- there's been uh, ups and downs in that. You know, there was definitely a couple of years there where there, there wasn't a lot of new content being produced in the space. But here over the last uh, year or so, it's just been an explosion of new shows and new genres of content. And I think that's what's really been propelling this whole podcasting area forward here is, is that, that fact that content is coming into this area in a much faster way now than really, really ever before. And I have a cat that wants to get on TV. <laughs> my, my, um, do- my dog is, is, is knocking at the door right now. He's like, what are you doing in there? Yeah, exactly. So I think that content is the, is the, the real driver of that. I mean, you have to produce a good show and you have to have artwork that, that presents it professionally. And I think you, I think you have to have a unique angle and a unique hook, uh, to differentiate yourself out there. And I think, um, you know, I've talked about this a, a lot with a lot of people that have been successful and, 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 and I do go, go back to even, even my, my own show back in the early days of this, this, um, you know, podcasting and, and radio stuff. And, it gets back to just the amount of work that it takes to get your name out there. You know, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. You built built a network yourself, and all the work that has to go in there. You're doing this, this you know, this broadcasters association here, and and that's a marketing strategy for you to build 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 your name. And I think you have to be kind of multi multi capable. Um, you know, I got. I spent a lot of time going on other radio shows and other podcasts and, and getting, getting my name out about who, who Absolutely. I was. Absolutely. You have to and put I yourself think, out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you have to go to conferences. I mean, you have to write articles. You have to um, really, really engage specifically with the, the, the people that have an interest in your focus area and, and, and become a, you know, a name there. I think that, that that's like fundamental one-on-one. You can't just sit in front of a microphone and voice it and then put it out there and not do anything beyond that because uh, there's just too much noise. You have to, I mean, it's even worse now than it was back, back when I started. Um, there's just so many shows and so much competition um, to, you know, for that audience. And I think that one of the biggest challenges that the podcasting has is, is scaling the audience to match the growth of the content. And I think um, that is kind of from an industry perspective, I think it's a, it's a challenge, um, you know, to, to, to somehow make that happen. I think it's happening just organically, you know, and it's being propelled mostly by, by Apple right now. Yeah. Um, and, and because they have such a huge chunk of the, the listening audience today. But I think that th- th- there's a lot of other ways that people can get, get access to the content now. So, I, you know, being successful doesn't always um, come from, you know, 100% from, from Apple and the, the iTunes podcast area now. I think it comes from a lot of other places too. Um, so, so I mean, get your show out there in as many places as you can. Um, get in other media. If you can get on TV or you can get on radio or you can get on more, more 
traditional media as an expert around the, the area or the genre that you focus on, uh, I think that that'll only only help you in trying you know write articles for other publications and and just put yourself out there. You know, you have to. You brought up the conference. You're going to be at a conference in about a week now. Uh, the podcast movement, yep. which is a yep. new conference. Uh, they they it, it seems like a lot of people are involved now. And tell me a little bit about that. What are you going to be doing there? Because I'm hoping next year I'm going to probably go. Uh, my my summers here are insane. My, my you know I travel a lot and. My wife is going to Poland next week, so we're, we're wow. all over the place. So it, it actually, you know what? It happened at the worst time in the world, this, this conference for me. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to go next year. So tell me about what you're going to be doing there and what the focus of the conference is, because from what I know, it's a little bit different. Yeah, well, I think what's, what's different about it is that it's, it's focused on podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the other conferences have not been focused on podcasting. You know, if you look back to the very early days of the podcast community back in 2005, back back the the New Media and Podcast Expo, which started this whole thing, which later became, you know, the the New Media Expo, and then uh, what we know know, know today, um, you know, merged with you know, Blog World. And so, so I think what's different about it is that we're going back to the early days of trying to build community. And that's, that's why I jumped into this because th this is the only podcast focused national conference that's going to happen in 2014. Well, for the bulk of 2014, um, you know, the New Media Expo did happen in January, but, but as far as the next New Media Expo, which was or and currently is the kind of the flagship conference for podcasting isn't going to happen until like mid-year in 2015 yeah yeah i get that uh, i got i got word of that yeah. too which i i think that's great actually from what what i've yeah what i've yeah. heard um so you so know, this, here's my issue with this and, and and i you know i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna, i'm gonna be honest with you because we know each other and you're not gonna think i'm a jerk i think a lot there's a lot of noise with some of these conferences uh yes. and if it's a podcasting conference Obviously, you have to incorporate other aspects of it, but it shouldn't be overtaken by marketing. And no. I feel that this happens in this in, in podcasting. This has happened over the last couple of years where it's not about the content. It's not about the quality of the content. It's become a use my seven steps and generate a half a million dollars a year. This is how I'm doing it. When the reality is the, yeah. that's an impossible thing for most people. It may yeah. work for some, but it's impossible. So are they being proactive in the sense where they don't want it to be that? They don't want it to be about use my SEO tool and you know get viewers. Obviously, you have to talk about that, but how are they making sure that doesn't become you know overrun by that yeah. kind of stuff? Well, I think it's a nav it, it's a little bit of a natural kind of evolution of the space. I, you know, back in the earlier days of podcasting, th there was a lot of um, I know, there was a lot of buzz around um, podcast consultants, and it, it everybody that was going to the conference was trying to become a podcast consultant. Same thing happened with social media, and and you get a lot of folks that are trying to figure out ways to 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 monetize to justify spending. Um, time doing podcasting, which is what they 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 love to do. They they love to talk. They love to build fan bases, and th there's only a certain number of ways that you can monetize that. And I think what what you see happening is you see you've seen a lot of folks in you know like the the space of building your own business and sure. you know small business entrepreneurial kind of, shift and know, it, exactly that that have come into the space. You know. I have all the answers and I know how to do it. You can, you can make this amount of money and I can actually show you, you know, a copy of the check that I made. Um, but, but oftentimes a lot of that doesn't come directly from podcasting. It, it, it comes from building an audience that has a fan base for you. Sure. Uh, that's, that's envious of your, you know, success that you've had because you put out a, you know, a, a class or a training or something like that. Um, and I think it, um, it, it's just another way to, to monetize the medium, which has been different than what the roots of the medium have been, and that's around you know sponsorship and advertising, and and really no advertising. Do you, um, do you think we're we're kind of as as a as an industry we're kind of smarting up to that stuff where we're we're saying, well, you have nothing. Uh, to, I mean, this really 
has nothing to do with podcasting. It has nothing to do with content creation. What are you doing? Like, do you see a cleanse of sorts happening with this? With you know, uh, podcast uh, podcast movement is is being inactive, and I know a lot of people at at New Media Expo they're they're shifting their focus too, saying, "Okay, guys, this isn't yeah. really what we're trying to do." I get it, but it's about the podcaster. It's not about use my tools and make your business successful. Yeah, and I've been really, really pushing for that for for years. Is that you know these these conferences and these events need to really focus on. You're one of the good guys. Uh, driving You're one of the core, good guys. Oh, like driving core values to success in this medium, um, and it and it's irregardless of how you're using the medium for your own personal, uh, you know, income or success or however you want to want to equate those things. Um, but to focus on core success principles. And I think that's what I've been driving forward for many years is, is just based on my, my experience and my, my learning. So when I go to these conferences, I don't go to it to, to promote uh, really anything other than helping, um, the industry develop and learn best practices and things like that. And that's, that's one of the, well, that's, that's a little bit of the topic that I'm going to be covering in a panel that I'm pulling together down there about whether to be a part of a, a podcast network or, or not and what what the fit is. And I have Todd Cochran, um, who I do the the new media show with, is going to be on the panel with me. And then Mike Chaffee, who was the founder and is the CTO of Corolla Digital, is going to be on on stage. And we're, we're going to talk uh, you know, specifically about an area that, that we don't have any monetization, you know, there's no way for us to make money on what we're going to talk about. We're just yeah. talking about why somebody would want to be part of a podcast network or, or not, or should they be? Um, so, and, and what, and what network what and, and what network should they be part of? Yeah. Well, yeah. and, and I mean, a lot of podcasters shouldn't be part of any network. Um, they should just be doing what they do. It depends on what their, what their focus is and what their goals are. And it, it I mean, it really gets back to that. Um, and, and so anyway, that, that's, that's going to be the topic of what I'm going to cover there. But every, every event, you know, like the, the New Media Expo since it started back in 2005, I've been involved in a panel talking about, you know, metrics in the space around um, platforms, what people are trying to do, what the best practices are. And, and that's always been my focus. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you, you, you've always been honest about this. And, and I've. I saw you at Blog World a couple of years ago and people come up to you and they ask you a question and, you know, you're very polite and you're very cordial, but you're very honest also. And you pretty much tell them like, listen, I don't personally think this works or I think this is the way that it's going. Um, and I think that's needed in this market because there's a lot of misinformation going out, a lot yeah. of misinformation, a lot of bad information, uh, the technical aspect of it, the business aspect of it. Um, no. I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping it simple. Uh, the simpler it is, the more the better it's going to work. You don't need to overly complicate things. Uh, yep. And I kind of feel like when you complicate it, it's better to pitch a product for some people. Mm-hmm. And, and it kind of ties into that. And I think there's some great people in there. I think there's some not so great people in this space, but the market's going to yeah. tell for itself. And, and those not so great people are going to people are going to smarten up and they're going to go away mm-hmm. eventually and go into another genre. Yeah, and I think that's that's been the history in the podcasting space too. A lot of people come and go. There's a natural weeding out that that that, that happens, and if you think about it, there's always this core that um, has been writing in this space for ten plus years that everybody knows about. But there's a lot of people that come and go in this space that try and take advantage of it or um, don't don't do best practices, and they they basically wash out of it. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, we're running out of time here, but I, I want to thank Darn. you for coming on. Yeah, I know. We're, we're always running out of time. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on because it's it's always an interesting conversation with you because you're not talking about the technical stuff. You're not talking about the content with me. You're actually talking about the back end of podcasting, and you're talking about the inside stuff of podcasting. And I think it's important for people to talk about that because you're a guy that's in the industry. You're not yep. outside looking in, so you kind of see these trends if I to leave, you know, to end the show with what what do you think the next trend is? What do you see happening? What what's the next movement for 
uh, podcasters. No pun intended, obviously. But <laughs> oh, I think that the the move to um, easier consumption in um, cars, I think, is is um, a a huge um, shift that's going to happen. I think I, there's been a lot of people that have kind of said, you know, I don't know, I don't think it's a big, big going to make a big difference. Um, I I tend to differ on that because I can I can visualize what this is gonna gonna look like based on the trend lines that I can see with technology today, and it's it's a much bigger thing that I see more centered around capabilities of mobile devices than just specifically podcasting. I just think that the technology of what we're gonna see in our handsets and our phones is going to uh, really. Uh, transition this medium into something that's going to be that's going to I think u- ultimately replace radio um, in 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 most people's lives and in their cars um, and I think we can't fully appreciate how much how big of a shift that's going to be um, that's that's coming it could take another five to six years before we really see it because the the timelines for getting capabilities in the car that are what I'm talking about here, um, the timelines are pretty long. Yeah, and the automakers um, are kind of slow to kind of adapt new technologies. Yeah. So, um, yeah, exactly, and that's that that's for good that's for good reason. But anyway, do you think there's a place for video still? How do you in, see video in, video evolving in podcasting on the podcasting side? Yeah, because it's been slow. Uh, I think I think for a lot of people they they've made the jump, but it's been a slow transition. There's two things that have been slow: live has been slow, and video has been really slow. So I think live live will remain slow, um, probably forever. Yeah, <laughs> and I love doing the, it live. I love it. No, I do too. I mean, I I enjoy it. I never did it well. I did it early days back back when I was doing doing my show in a radio station. It was a very frustrating experience, though. But um, we don't have time to go into that. But um, but I think that live is basically never going to get traction in an on demand world, and and it's. It's going to be good for connecting with a small um, subset of your audience and creating some, you know, some interactive experiences and things like that. You know, you know, forums and comment threads, kind of like you know what you do on your show as you're doing your show live. You know, listeners or viewers can get in there and you know write in a discussion uh, list and and provide feedback to the show. I've always liked that aspect of it. Um, and I, I, Todd Cochran always says that it makes you a better broadcaster to be able to I do totally agree with that I totally agree with that uh, uh, I, I also think it teaches you to not be stupid and say <laughs> something stupid I mean I, I've made that listen I make that mistake all the time uh, and I'm still learning but you kind of you're kind of like okay maybe I shouldn't say that because this is live and I can't really edit it afterwards because it's been said and people heard it so like yeah. your thinking kind of changes too with live um, I did it yeah, yeah, I did a I pre-recorded podcast yeah. uh, a couple months ago for somebody and I said some stuff I should not have said on that show, but I kind of did it because I knew it wasn't live, and I felt that, like, oh, nobody's in the room with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, a week went by, and then I found out there were a lot of people in the room with us the following day when they were listening to it. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right about the car, and it's going to take time, but obviously when that happens, uh, that's going to be the thing that really, you know, I could listen to Rob, I could listen to Todd, I could listen to Andrew, let me just press the button, and here it is. Well, it's also about um, your device knowing what uh, shows you um, have passionate for, you know, and 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 delivering those to you right when you get in the car and making those, you know, a one-click experience or a one-voice gesture thing, you know, like play new media show or play, you know, what the tech, you know, um, and and your device will know what you're talking about and they'll it'll just start playing. You know, I mean, it's it's really as simple as that. And I think once once we get to that point, and I believe that a, AM FM capability in the car is going to be a choice that's down the list. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not going to be like right there with that knob right there that you can just turn on, or it automatically comes on when you turn the ignition on. I think that's going away. Uh, it, internet is king. Uh, I, I stand by that, and and it's going to take time, but eventually it's going to hit you know the car and and. and more people yeah. are going to be able to listen to it that way. Rob, I want to thank you for coming on. Rob Greenlee, uh, you could find him. Where can people find you? You're on Twitter. Rob Greenlee on Twitter. Yep. You do the uh, new Rob, media show. 
Yeah. Uh, robgreenly.com is a good one. Um, also, uh, newmediashow.com if you want to see the, the weekly Saturday show that I do with Todd, Todd Cochran the, where we talk about um, deep issues uh, around podcasting and new media. And we have guests on to, from a variety of sectors of the podcasting space. I've been on uh, it. Great. I've always had a great time whenever I'm on it. Yeah, it's a great it's a fun show and it's it's done like like this, you know. Um we just call each other Saturday mornings and you know, I get a guest and we just rap. You know, there's no prep, there's no nothing. We just we just talk about what's happening right off the cuff, you know, which is what I love about live. Um, you know, I did many years of pre pre-produced radio and, and it's it's kind of refreshing just to get on a mic and a no camera pressure. and and just just talk with somebody like you're talking to them across the table in a coffee shop. So yeah. and that's that's kind of how I look at it. Uh, so and that's the best thing about what we do. Uh, you're going to be at the podcast movement uh, yep. next week. Yep. You have a 16th, panel there. A lot, of, a lot of great people are going to be speaking there. A lot of people in podcasting. A lot of people from the other side of podcasting, such as you. You're going to be speaking there. Um, also, uh, what else? I'm not forgetting. Am I forgetting something? Oh, Podcast One. How could I forget Podcast One? Uh, phenomenal. Podcast one. Yeah. Phenomenal. And, and I don't say this too often uh i'm a big fan of the product uh they have unbelievable podcasts on there <laughs> my personal favorite is the steve austin show uh <laughs> and it's not always about wrestling either he doesn't always talk about wrestling so it, it's actually well and you do a wrestling show on your i own do network. i do do a yeah. wrestling show uh yeah. so it, it, it's awesome. i'm really interested in it uh podcast yeah. one.com you should definitely check it out and uh, that's it, guys. We're wrapping up. If you miss any portion, portion of the show, you can check it out on our website, ibroadcastnetwork.org. Uh, we have a phenomenal forum there. Over 1,000 members on that forum. A lot of experts in audio, video, content, uh, the technical aspects of podcasting. So essentially everything you could imagine with internet broadcasting, there's someone there to help you out. Uh, ibroadcastnetwork.org. Also, the GFK Network. We syndicate the show via the GFK Network, gfknetwork.com. Uh, we're everywhere podcasts are available. Uh, we're going to be back in two weeks. Uh, we're taking off. We do it every other week uh, with another phenomenal guest. I'll announce it this week, and uh, we'll see you all then.